What's up, gangsters? How about another of the rarest things on my YouTube channel these days? A completed model project video and review. Yep, and this time it's going to be for the 148th Arma Hobby PZLP11C. So, what's going to be uh, different about this little review is that Whereas I normally do them in two parts, like I'll do, I'll build a little bit and then I'll give you like a quick sort of review of the kit and then I'll come back later and do the finished one. Yeah, well, this kit is super simple. Literally one sprue and it's a total of like 75 parts. So there's only going to be one of these videos and this is it. But before we get into all the details, as usual, let's see what I was able to accomplish with this thing. Okay, so here it is, but uh, before I get into talking about the kit and building it, let's first take a quick look at the usual stuff, uh, what's in the box. Now, obviously, as I said, because this thing was literally one sprue, well, two if you count the clear sprue, which had exactly one part on it, that being the windshield. Uh, yeah, can't show you any of the sprues, but that's okay. We'll talk about the, uh, the bits and pieces in a minute. In addition to the 1.1 sprues <laughs> that are in the box, um, you get a sheet of decals, and these decals are what I've come to expect from Arma now after having built two of their things good decals beautifully printed everything wonderfully in register you can see right there you know that's a that's a good place for there to be some errors when you've got red on white um, it shows really easily if there's problems you know stuff like this little bug insignia um, just you know just just really good um, very thin they apply very well. Um, so, you know, look, if you got to use decals, these are the kind of decals you want. And these came from TechMod. Now, one thing that I did notice 
When I built my first Arma project, it was their 172nd scale Mustang P51B slash C. And I tested those decals to see if you could do the trick where you remove the clear film by scrubbing it with mineral spirits. This is a trick that's been discussed off and on uh, over the years. Got a lot of attention with Edward decals because of their whole, you know, peel the film off thing. Turns out that mineral spirit scrubbing works really good with Edward decals, but they're not the only ones. And so I had tested it when I built the Mustang and that trick worked pretty good. Maybe half and half. Actually, if you go back and watch that video, you'll know that it wasn't quite that simple, but nonetheless, I tried it with these, it did not seem to work at all. So uh, I had to do the standard thing with decals in order to make sure that there were no issues with clear film showing up um, when it gets hit by a lacquer uh, because it reacts differently than the lacquer paint around it. Because as you know, I put the decals directly on the paint. Anyway. The trick to preventing that is to spray over it with an inert clear, uh, like aqua gloss, which is what I use for it, and then sand it down so that the edges are blended in and you've got a surface that's not going to react to a subsequent coat of like MRP Super Clear Matte or Guns GX113, which are two of my very favorite unglosses. Anyway, so all that being said, the decals were, were pretty good, but I did have some problems, and I'll show you that on the model when we get to it. Anyway, in addition to the decals, um, we've got a pretty nice uh, set of, we had a pretty nice set of photo etch. And I gotta say, this photo etch was really, really good. It's well, well designed. Uh, it's nice, soft brass, didn't need to anneal it. Uh, I was able to, to just chop all of them off of there with a scalpel blade. The only one I didn't use was the rear view mirror. I just, yeah, I was just out of energy at that point, decided it didn't really have to be there, so I skipped it. But good photo etch. All right, now let's talk about the instructions. Um, Arma does a great job with their instructions. They, uh, they give you, um, you know, they're not minimalist like some of these uh, kit producers are. They give you everything you need, and they're just fun to use. Uh, right off the bat, you get a sprue map, which I always love, because sometimes you need to just be able to go and look. And in this case, as I said, it's only one sprue, so it's a pretty simple map. I mean, this whole kit's like 75 parts, maybe, uh, including said photo etch. They give you a nice set of color references. Unfortunately, none of them were for MRP, which of course is my favorite, but that's okay. I just blended my colors as usual. Anyway, so you can kind of see, they do a good job. Uh, one thing that I like that they do pretty well is they'll give you like the instruction steps, and then in, at least on a lot of these, they'll give you a completed view so that you've got some idea of what the thing is supposed to look like. And that's pretty important, for example, like right here with the wheels, because they are supposed to have a bit of an angle to them. Um, we'll talk about that again in a minute. Um, so, yeah, you know, overall, this there's just really nothing, nothing to complain about. They give you color callouts for the color chart that they use. It's pretty easy to tell when you're supposed to be using photo etch. Um, it's just, yeah, just overall a really good set of instructions. And then you get some beautiful large color plates, uh, which are always nice, and um, they give you a little bit of historical information. So, good stuff. Now, the one that I chose to build was this one right here. Um, and I chose this one for one simple reason. <laughs> It's the most interesting one of the whole bunch, except for maybe this one. I mean, you basically, with Polish World War II fighters, they can be brown or brown. So this one has a little bit of a story, and there's more to it, and you can read about it on Arma's uh, blog on their website. They've got a pretty cool blog where they talk a lot about historical notes and build tips and things. 
Um, but this one, nobody really knows exactly why it was painted like this. Some people think that it was captured by the Germans and they painted it and used it for some reason. Other people think that maybe it was uh, part of a, uh, like this historical note here, painted with an experimental camouflage. So yeah, it's not really clear, but I also didn't really care because I thought it looked pretty cool. And for what I was trying to accomplish with this project, I felt like it was a pretty good choice because I wanted it to be eye-catching. So there you go, that's that. All right, now to the build itself. Um, this is probably gonna be like literally the quickest one of these ever, because again, one sprue. So, um, I had, uh, let, well, let me talk about the kit first. Okay, overall, I'm gonna say this kit, yeah, I think I'd have to give it like, I don't know, like uh, probably a high 80s on my sort of silly little informal scoring system. Yeah, maybe a 90, I don't know. It's good, all right? And it should be said that this was Arma's, uh, I believe, second kit that they produced ever, and first in 148th scale. And honestly, when you consider that, it's really impressive. I mean, I think it would be a, a really good kit, regardless of you know where in a, a, a model kit company's history it came along, but the fact that it was like one of their first things really, you know, makes it makes it even even more impressive. I've you know had a lot of conversations with Greg. Um, I'm not even going to try to say his how his name really is, um, but he's the marketing guy for Arma. We had him uh, on the Sprue Cutters Union. Super cool guy. And he told us that pretty much everybody that works on these kit designs um, is a model maker. And you can really kind of feel the love that goes into these. And uh, they, they just do good stuff, and I think they're going to continue to do good stuff. Now, that does not mean that it's perfect, okay? Um, there, there are a few quibbles that I have with it, but they really are about engineering and maybe a little bit about fit. But overall... There's not much to complain about. The engineering is pretty solid in most cases. The fit is pretty good in most cases. I didn't have to fight with much of anything. Um, and the molded detail is outstanding. It's, I think, honestly, the best part about this kit. All right, if you really get in here, you can see how crisp these panel lines are. These may be the best panel lines of any aircraft model I've ever run into. And what I mean by that is that not only do they just visually to me look about right, I mean, you know, the scale of panel lines is always subject to debate. And, and what's really important to me is other than just the overall look, like I look at these and I think, okay, these look nicely, you know, sized. Uh, for a 148 scale kit, uh, you know, whereas you have some companies like <laughs> Airfix um, that I won't <clears throat> mention by name, where their panel lines, you know, look like you could fly an X-wing uh, down the down the trench. They're so big. That's just not the case here. These are really nicely uh, sized. But what I really love about them is how they work when you start to do washes. Nothing frustrates me more with aircraft models than when the panel lines are sort of vague and you can't keep your washes in them. You know what I'm talking about. You put the wash in, it flows, it looks super good. Then you come back with your Q-tip that's got even just a whiff of mineral spirits on it to remove the excess and you start pulling the wash back out of the panel lines because they're just not deep enough to keep the Q-tip from rubbing up against it, you know, even when you barely have any mineral spirits on it. These panel lines, the easiest I've ever used. They've got a really nice, crisp, rectangular profile. And not only are they deep enough to really hold the washes and give you good density and make everything look good, but the removal was the most painless of, of any I've ever done. I, it was like, I was just like, okay, what universe am I even in right now? Because I actually ended up enjoying that part of it. And it's a good thing because, 
This kit probably also has more panel lines than anything I've ever built if you count the fact that the wings have this corrugated texture. Hopefully you can see it. There it is. That is how the real skin looks on this aircraft and it's the same on the top and the bottom as well as on the tail plane. And yeah, I'm not gonna lie, that was where all of my challenges were with this project. Beautifully molded. Um, the, uh, yeah, any issues that I had, I have to be very clear, were all on me because given how fine these panel lines are for those corrugations, it, as I found out to my chagrin, is really easy to get a little too much paint in there and make them not as crisp and uh, not as willing to hold on to a wash. Um, yeah, if I had to do it all over again, I don't know. I might actually, it might actually be a, a justifiable case of not priming. But at a minimum, I would prime much less. I mean, I don't ever prime thick anyway, but it just doesn't take much uh, with these. And so that was really kind of the only frustration I had with the kit. Um, you got to, I mean, for me anyway, at least the way I work, you got to use some primer, at least spot priming, because you've got a seam across the middle of the fuselage. You've got a pretty, uh, you know, a pretty substantial seam on the leading edge of the wings. And, uh, you know, so there's going to be some body work that's just inescapable, at least in my opinion, you know, the way that I like to do things. Um, but. Yeah, anyway, I, I'm rambling. Uh, the the uh, One of the challenges with that leading edge seam, as you can see, was there's just no way you're going to avoid uh, screwing up some of those panel lines that wrap around said leading edge. Um, and so I used my really thin uh, Tamiya razor saw uh, for the most part. Let's see, this thing right here. This is what I like to use to do uh, those situations like that because you can just, you know, you can just run it around the edge or over the top of a fuselage and it makes it really easy to keep the, keep the line straight. Anyhow, um, that part of it, all pretty straightforward. Uh, now, I mentioned that there were a couple of issues that I had with fit and engineering. Um, let me see if I can recall all of those because again, I built this, whew, I, I thought this was going to be a one month thing. I ended up tinkering with it for about four months and um, I started it first of April and I finished it right before IPMS Nationals in the uh, first week of August. So there you go. At any rate, um, the first issue that I had, as is the case with most aircraft models, came when I started on the cockpit, because yeah, you're gonna do that first. This cockpit, and let me show you, this is easier to see in the instructions. Um, this cockpit is a sort of a, a tubular frame affair, kind of like you see in stuff like the Hawker Hurricane, and it was not fun, all right? You can see. Um, what's going on there. You've got several sections. And this was frustrating because I really feel like that the ideal engineering condition for any model is that you can dry fit the parts and they will stay together on their own accord of friction uh, or at a minimum just with a little bit of good balance. And neither was the case with this cockpit sub-assembly. Um, you really could not put the sides on the floor and have it stay. And then this piece right here, um, with the that's it's a little sort of cross brace thing with these photo etch parts on it. It, it. it just you just couldn't do it, and and that was frustrating because I really like to be able to dry fit a sub assembly like this to kind of help me figure out my painting strategy, and, you know, and see what's really gonna be visible, kind of think about weathering. And maybe that's just me, I don't know, but I, I just maintain that that's really 
when aircraft, when model kit engineering is at its best is when you can put something together and have it stay together without glue or much tape. Um, I was able to put this together with tape, but it's so small that it was just really kind of a hassle. So I really felt like that that was a fail. And we know it's possible because look, as much as I hate to take Tamiya's name in vain, they pull it off all the time. Now, fit-wise, there was a major frustration here, and Greg and I talked about this, and he acknowledged it. See how here on uh, this uh, little sub-assembly here, on this uh, part uh, four, you've got those photo etch gizmos that slide on there like it's kind of a shaft. Yeah none of them would go on easily. There was, there was zero clearance. I spent way too much time trying to get those parts on there and it involved basically reducing the size of the little shaft piece on the plastic and using extra thin as lubricant to get it to go, which, you know, you really just don't want to have to fight with stuff like that. It's just not fun. Um, you know, but again, tolerancing is a thing that I think companies figure out over time and they frankly haven't had a lot of time, um, to do that. Hopefully they get better at it as, uh, you know, as they go down the road. So that was kind of the major beef. Otherwise with the cockpit, everything else was, was good. No, no real issues there It all. You know, once I got it put together, it fit inside the fuselage and everything was happy, happy. For the most part, um, after that, everything really did fit good and went together easily with, uh, again, only one exception that I can really recall. And that was here with the wheels. <laughs> and yeah, I had a real kind of disaster with those. So the first thing is, if you look, you'll see that they recommend a, that, that the wheels have camber. Now. The first thing that confused me was when I looked at reference photos, I had a hard time verifying that, but hey, I trust these guys. I ended up kind of splitting the difference between straight up and down and what they show here. The other problem here was, as you can see, they didn't allow the flat spot to conform properly to the wheel being at an angle. And that's a little bit of a chafe. I made a base for mine that had a dirt like airfield uh, uh, thing going on. So I was able to sort of bury that and it wasn't too big of a deal, but you know, it's a thing. But the real problem, and this is kind of a self-inflicted gunshot wound, okay? If you look at this, what they want you to do is install the gear legs to the fuselage and those fit really well and the engineering is relatively solid, I think, but there's a little bit of slop. You're not gonna just put it on there and guarantee that they're in the right orientation. And so, what I elected to do, especially uh, given that I wanted to make sure that this angle on the wheels was right, and I was painting and weathering these while they were still on the sprue, I ended up putting the wheels on the legs first. And I felt good about that because, well, you can see that they're keyed, right? So that should put the flat spot in the correct orientation, right? Should be no problem. Yeah, well, there were two problems. One is that these didn't fit. There was no clearance between this axle and the bore in the middle of the wheel. So I had to, again, tinker with the size of this to get them on there in the first place. And so, I, and that's part also of why I chose to put the wheels on before I mounted the legs to the fuselage. Because fussing with that while it was already attached to the plane was gonna be way more of a hassle than I wanted to deal with. And then the other thing was, was also painting strategy. Anyway, so I had the wheels on there. <laughs> Then when I actually added them to the fuselage, that's when I discovered that even though they're keyed to get the flat spot in the correct orientation, they need to be handed because <laughs> my flat spots were facing the wrong direction. I mean, just imagine, 
that the thing is sitting here and you can see that the flat spot should be kind of at the rear of the wheel when it's clocked correctly because it's a tail sitter. <laughs> yeah, my flat spots were in the front. So yeah, it was not good. I basically had to uh, take the wheels off, which meant breaking them off and drilling and pinning and then doing a bunch of fixturing and measuring and fussing and sweating to make sure that the wheels were not only properly oriented, but that they were the same on both sides. And it was, yeah, it was not fun. I was pissed, but you know, I got through it. The other thing that I did while I was there is you can see that there are a couple of braces uh, that go between the wheel axle and the uh, fuselage, all right? And you can see those dotted lines right there. They don't give you that. Um, they just tell you, make some. <laughs> Which, yeah, okay, two problems with that. One is the brace, I went and looked at reference photos and the brace is kind of like a flattened uh, rod. It's not round and it's not airfoil shaped. It's just kind of like a strap. And so what I did to make that was I took a piece of Albion Alloys uh, nickel silver tubing and I basically sandwiched it between a couple of one two three blocks and smacked it with a hammer a few times and flattened it and it made a nice little strut but attaching it to these tiny little things yeah not good I ended up what I ended up doing was basically chopping that little uh, bolt head shaped thing off of there and using the edge of a knife to reduce its diameter enough that I could put a piece of aluminum tubing that was big enough for the round part of the strut I made to slip inside of and super gluing it all on there. And I'll show you that when I flip the model over. But at any rate, that was kind of a fun little challenge. I also uh, chose to uh, replace or not really replace it didn't have any uh, let me you know what let me just flip it over and we'll just... okay here we go so these are said braces and I think they ended up looking pretty cool but you can see what I'm talking about with these whatever you call them uh, you know fasteners bolsters whatever in the middle and they were super fragile. I broke them once. Um, did not really care for the engineering there. I feel like this is one of those things where, yeah, they did a good job of making it look like the real thing, but this is one of those things where I think a buildability choice should have been first consideration. Um, and maybe give you some photo etch since it is really just a flat strap. Anyway, you can see what I'm saying about having a piece of round tubing glued to the nub of the plastic part and then slipping the other tubing because there's still a round section on the end of that flattened thing uh, into it and you know getting it the right length and all I did for the end of it was just fold it bend it and glue it there which is not really correct but again buildability getting them to be the right length was a uh, little bit of an adventure but uh, yeah managed to get it done and I think it looks pretty cool looks pretty good now uh, since I'm talking about replacing I really was trying not to do any of that stuff with this thing I really wanted to build it straight out of the box but there was no choice with those and with these little rods um, for the rudder control you can just barely see them under there you know it was just too easy to put a piece of nickel silver wire in there and take care of that. There was one other thing that I did um, on the top um, for the, uh, uh, that, that, that was not out of the box. Let me flip it back over and I will show you. Well, two things really, uh, because I guess I have to include the uh, aerials and I'll talk about those in a second. But there's a couple of grab handles right 
there in front of the cockpit on either side of the windscreen. And those are photo etch parts. Um, but, you know, as all photo etch, they're just flat. And that's not very authentic because those are, you know, bars, grab bars, grab handles. So, because I had a bunch of those 3D printed, yes, that's right, I 3D printed them. And I know, I know, several of my buddies have been giving me no end of shit about 3D printing something that you could bend in 30 seconds, bro, with, out of a piece of wire. Yeah, well, maybe if your hands work good. But in the amount of time it took me to design those things and stick them on my printer, then go away and do something else, and then come back and get them, I maintain that I was actually faster, especially when you consider that I needed like 10 of them for the actual project. You can see they're festooned. This little Sherman, this is the Tamiya 148th Sherman, and it's festooned with grab handles. There's like 10 of them, so I just printed like 20. <laughs> And I drilled my holes. I made them all match sets of holes using a pair of dividers. I knew that they all had to be two and a half millimeters apart. Super easy to create, you know, center punches. Then go back and drill them all using my Proxon. And then my little handles just drop right in. And every single one of them worked first time. And they all went into the correct depth because I designed them with a little collar. You can't see it so that they go in to the correct depth. And all I had to do to stick them in there sufficiently was just wick a little bit of extra thin into it because even though extra thin doesn't melt resin, it melts the plastic enough to kind of act like adhesive. So anyway, I'm actually pretty proud of those little handles. I was able to paint them silver before I even put them on and that all worked out really good. Okay. Now, the other thing that I did that was not in the box was the aerials. And they give you a pretty good diagram um, for what they're supposed to look like. And it's complicated, like a lot of these early war aircraft were. You got uh, one going uh, from each wing tip and the middle of the fuselage all joining at a central point and then having this little wire that goes uh, from there to the tail. And I don't know, this seemed kind of intuitive to me, but a lot of people seem to think that this was really like magical for some reason, <laughs> because I was able to get them all to meet at the same place and be even and straight. They're not even and straight right now. Uh, because I just had it upside down and it was pressing on this. And by the way, this is Easy Line, the fine stuff, which you can see is kind of flat. And when it twists, it looks a little weird, but I, you know, I wasn't too worried about it for this. At any rate, that's the beauty of, of Easy Line, because if you bump into it or whatever, you're not going to fuck it up. So anyway, back to the thing. Um, I knew that it was the, that the challenge was going to be getting them all to meet, all five strands to meet at the same place right here in the middle. So what I did was I made the tailpiece first, and you can see that it's got it's one piece, and there's a loop on each end that goes through a ferrule that is Albion aluminum tubing, and that was a bit of a trick. Trust me. <laughs> to get both uh, thicknesses of the easy line to go through the little piece of tubing was, uh, yeah, it was, it was some work, but it was worth it. Because then once I got the loop on each end and got it super glued, then I just attached it to the little post here, which I was somehow able to not break off for the entire build. And then with the loop there, I could run a single piece from one side of the wing to the other through the loop, same thing with the fuselage. And so this connection in the middle floats and you can see it's a little bit crooked, but to adjust it, I can just move it over and instantly straighten it out. See what I mean? It floats. There is no glue between the five strands right there where they all come together. So anyway, I thought it worked out pretty good. I was stoked. All right, now, so that's pretty much everything with the kit itself, I think. Not a whole lot more to say. Oh, there was one other thing that really annoyed me. 
Sorry, I gotta point those things out. See these little, uh, these are little photo etch bits and I'm gonna get a pointer. There is no way I'm getting my finger near the damn things. These little bits right here, okay? The gun sight parts. Yeah, those are photo etch. And the good news is they give you a little post that's molded into the top of the wing with a, it's like a millimeter square and it's got a very flat spot on top of it. So you bend the bottom of each of these two parts into an L and you glue it on there. Now, okay, that's certainly not the worst engineering decision, but it's pretty close to it. Those kind of things, given that you're gonna be adding them on at the very end of the build whenever everything else is already painted and finished, should not be a cause for drama, right? It should be like stone axe simple. As in, these things should plug into like a slot where again, you could stick them on there and they would stay put so that you could then wick some extra thin cyanoacrylate in there to secure them, right? You should be able, that of all the kinds of parts that you want to be able to dry fit, it's little bitty stuff like this. And it just isn't possible with the way these are made. They will not in any way, shape, or form balance on top of the little plastic post and wait for you to add some glue. You have to put glue on the post, then add this part, hoping that while you're holding it tight enough to make the CA cure, that you're holding it straight. And as you can see, if you looked at it from the exact right angle, mine are not exactly straight. They're a little tilted to one side. So yeah, anyway, super annoying. And in my opinion, kind of inexcusable as an engineering fail. One other place where I had a little bit of photo etch drama, and I wouldn't really call this a fail as just something that really could use a little refinement, is in here. If you look inside the engine, you'll see these struts, okay? These photo etch struts, there's six of them, and they weren't too bad, but really the slots should have been deeper so that again, you could have stuck them all in there, dry fit, and then come back around with a little bit of extra thin CA and secured each one of them. But that was not nearly as much drama as the gun sight parts. At any rate, it all got done. I'm pretty happy with the way that the thing built up. And again, I'd probably give it like an 85 overall. Um, because it's overall a really beautiful little kit. It's really pretty well thought out, especially one of the things that I love is the way that the wings and the tail are engineered to go on. I built and painted and weathered pretty much the entire thing before I added the wing to the fuselage because the way that the wing goes on is just so straightforward and so bulletproof. And I'll show you again real quick in the instructions. Um, it's got this, this big opening right here in the top of the fuselage, and there's a corresponding U-shaped uh, ridge on the inside of the wing, and they make perfectly lots of surface area for extra thin. The fit's good. You can pretty much count on the wing going on there correctly, and I was really impressed with that. The tail, also, I was super impressed with the engineering, but as I found out, you can't quite depend on it as much as you'd like to. If you look, okay, you can see when you put the thing together, the it's got this sort of, of recess for the tail. And the horizontal stabilizers are one piece. Now, I don't know if this is a thing with all of Arma's kits, but it was the same with the Mustang, and I love this. Because we all know from building aircraft kits that, that this is one of the most poorly engineered parts of every aircraft kit. And it's way too easy for the tail to be uneven. So having it all in one piece, at least in theory, should help make things go a lot better. And in this case, it dropped on there perfectly. And then you add the vertical stabilizer and it all just really fit 
beautifully. Like, I did not have to do anything to these. Okay, you can see, uh, let, me, let me grab it up here so you can see better. All right, this, you can see the panel lines right here around the tail. And they just all look like natural panel lines, like everything else. I didn't have to do anything to those. That's the natural fit. Really, really beautifully engineered and, and, and molded, and the fit was really good. But, I have to say this. You'd like to think that if all of that being true, and given that you've got a set of braces underneath that tail, that everything would combine to being perfectly right with the world. Yeah, well, it wasn't. And I didn't figure that out until after I had the wing on and the wheels on and I started taking a good look at it. And I was like, yeah, there's some stuff here that's out of whack. And given that I was building this for the sole purpose of taking it to an IPMS contest, we all know that in the aircraft categories, at least, at an IPMS contest, it's really a, a, a wheel and wing uh, and tailplane alignment contest. That's really all that, that, that they give a shit about. And so I had to make sure that that was all good. And basically, I ended up breaking the, the already very well glued tail and its struts loose after all of the paint and weathering had happened and doing some medieval type shit to get it all squared up to the point where when I put a digital height gauge on it, it was satisfactory and there was no error that was easy, you know, visible to the naked eye. It was not fun. It almost blew the whole point of the project for me. So. Um, not, you know, again, it, I, I, I don't know what they could have done differently. The engineering is really good. The fit is really good on the tail. It's just that there's enough slop, and this is not because it's sloppy. I'm just saying that the tolerances are loose enough, and they have to be, that you can still get an error, and you just have to not take anything for granted and make sure that you are paying attention and, you know, accounting for that. Anyway, so I've mentioned that I was building this thing for an IPMS contest. So now let me talk a little bit about the paint and finish. And this is going to be pretty quick and simple because quick and simple was the name of the game. IPMS has proven over and over again that they don't really give a shit about the artistry of paint and weathering. In fact, um, I personally believe, I've said it over and over again, there are people who are going to send me hate mail when I repeat this, I believe that there is a, a bias against weathering, at least with aircraft modeling, at IPMS contests. And you can see it in the results, you can see it on the tables when you go actually look at the work, and you can see it uh, as a participant and listening to other judges. I was a judge twice, so I don't feel like I'm off base. Now, do I think it's some kind of institutionalized conspiracy? Absolutely not. I think that it is just sort of a byproduct of the culture. And one of the things that I've speculated um, sort of contributing to that is the fact that at of the three contests I've been to now, only one of them had lighting that was worth a shit. And the truth is that a lot of fancy, subtle weathering things, like I'm doing over here on the little Sherman, just don't show up in bad lighting. It just doesn't look good. So, going back to the fact that I've selected this color scheme because it really stood out and was kind of eye-popping, yeah. This was all about making a model that stood out on the table because this was gonna be in the 148th Allied Radial category, which is one of, if not the biggest category of the entire show. There were 54 models in that category before they split it into US Navy and everybody else. And there were still 24, 25 models in the category after the split. Anyway, so I wanted it to stand out. I wanted a paint job that had some contrast, and my intent was to really do basically no weathering. 
Um, I wanted this to be what I consider like my interpretation of what I call the sort of IPMS illustrative style, where I'm not really trying to do subtle things like all of this chipping like that. All I really want to do is, is illustrate things like, okay, um, like on the bottom, rather than worrying about like the tones of the exhaust and you, you know, doing different things with oils and inks, I'm just going to make a black brown mix of uh, Liquitex acrylic ink and spray it on there in a way that looks like, hey, Look, there's an exhaust stain here because engine, right? That's all I really cared about achieving. So I think I, I think I was able to do that. And that was my intent really with the whole thing. Also, you know, to kind of go high contrast with the panel lines. So I used uh, Tamiya Black for all of the functional panel lines as I always do. And I used the uh, Tamiya Dark Brown because that was kind of a good compromise between the green and the brown, and I did that everywhere else. And again, the, the whole intent was to make it kind of high contrast. And um, I think, you know, it's not my favorite style. Somebody told me it's the most boring uh, model that I've ever built, <laughs> and I can't disagree, you know, but this wasn't about a love affair. One reason that I chose this kit for this project was because I knew I had a very specific task. Like I kind of wanted to test my theories about IPMS and weathering and whatnot. And so I didn't want to put any more time or effort into it than I had to. I wanted to just build something straight out of the box. I wanted to paint it. I wanted to do the simple finish and go with it. And so given that this kit had one sprue, was going to be pretty good quality and, you know, at least in theory, was going to be a relatively straightforward build. I felt like it was going to be the perfect candidate for my little, you know, sort of experiment, if you want to call it that. So that's it. There's really not a lot to say about the finish because it's as simple as it gets. Now, where I ran into trouble, though, was, as I mentioned, there were places with this corrugation where I got a little too much paint and the corrugation wasn't as crisp, and it didn't hold the wash as well, and I ended up having a little bit more of a sort of sludge wash, kind of grimier look than I had planned. And it turned out okay. I mean, I'm not, I'm not mad about it, but you can kind of see there where it's got a little bit of tonal variety. And honestly, you know, I'm all about tonal variety most of the time, but I wanted none. I wanted there to be a bunch of little brown lines there to show the texture. And that's not what I got because again, it just it, I just did not do a good job of maintaining the definition of that corrugation. But, you know, all's well that ends well, I suppose. Now, let me flip it over and I will talk about the decals again. Um, because this is where huh, that corrugation really was almost like I thought it was going to be my undoing because getting the decals to conform to that corrugation, and I was so glad there were none of, no decals on top, was a real pain in the ass. And what was frustrating about it was that I used my standard decal application method. Put the decal on there. I used some Mr. Mark setter underneath it because I knew that with the corrugation it might need a little bit of help. Um, and then put some more on top of it. And on this side, the decal conformed beautifully. Okay, where it's gray, that's all clear film. Where it's red is the only place that it had color. And you can see it really did pretty good. It took me like three tries to get everything to conform properly on this side. And by tries, I mean, you know, put it on, let it dry, apply some, you know, see where it's got problems, score with a sharp scalpel blade, 
to make sure that it's going to be able to drop down into those 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 corrugations and then add some more Mr. Mark setter. Yeah, worked fine. Took about three tries to get all of the little, uh, you know, uh, bad spots chased out of it. This other side, uh, WTF. It was just a disaster. I worked at it and worked at it and worked at it and still never got it really, whoops, to my satisfaction. It, it just, it just didn't want to play. And, and, and it's, and it's, it's, it's baffling, but at the same time, it is proof, at least to me, of what I always say, that the only thing that's certain about decals is that they're random as fuck. Because these came off of the same decal sheet, literally within inches less of each other. These two, these two uh, checkerboards right next to each other, right down here, the letters 62W literally right next to each other. The conditions on both sides of the, of the wing were the same. Same paint, same decal application method, same decal sheet, everything. And yet from this side to this side, they behaved totally differently. Now you would say, well, okay, but these two did different than these two and they came from you know different parts of the sheet it has to be something with the surface i understand that completely that would be my conclusion as well i'm just here to tell you i didn't do anything different with the surface on either side there was no big you know cheeto dust you know skin oil fingerprint type thing going on over here that wasn't going on over here. I just, I, I'm, it was baffling. I have no idea why they behaved so differently, but they did. And so I ended up just kind of having to work with it and produce a somewhat more eh, weathered, <laughs> you know, I hate to have to do that. I hate to have to make a, you know, bad technique or bad application disappear with weathering but sometimes you just got no choice and that's what I ended up doing kind of on this side and the other side so it all kind of worked but it really annoyed me because what I hate the most is when this stuff gets out of my control uh, you know I want whatever happens to be because I decided it was going to happen and then I executed a technique being forced into a situation like that never makes me happy so Anyway, that's, that's kind of what went down with, with the finish. But apparently, it wasn't altogether unsuccessful because, <laughs> yep, there we go. Yep, it actually won its category. And I don't know, you know, what that says about the results of my little experiment where, you know, n is equal to exactly one. It's not a significant statistical sample, but it's also not insignificant. I don't know. I feel exactly the same way about winning a, an IPMS uh, contest as I do about losing one, because when you really get into the thing, as I have for the last two or three years, you study the results, you study the way the judging is done, it really honestly is kind of a toss-up. <laughs> At least, you know, unless it's in a case like we have going on right now where there's been a serious allegation of very well-documented favoritism and corruption going on in one of the categories at this exact show. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if you just assume that it's the standard IPMS rubric, it, it's still kind of a toss-up. I mean, so I don't take it too seriously. I mean, it's fun to, to win always, but I'm not going to be like, hey, look at me, I won, because it's just not, I just can't take it that seriously. But what I do love are the awards. Rob Booth, one of the guys who's actually a bright hope in uh, IPMS's very dim-looking future, is responsible for coming up with these very cool awards. It's like an actual legit belt buckle. I mean, you heard it when I flopped it down here. You know, it's like it's real. It's real, real McCoy, and really just beautifully done. And honestly, I love this 
way more than I would love any kind of a plaque or trophy that I had to find space for. So anyway, there it is. That's the wrap up for this little project. Okay, so there you go. Sorry if it was kind of long and rambling, but hey, the good news is it was only one video instead of the usual two. So yeah, hey, and that's what the pause button is for. At any rate, um, it was, you know, it was, it was a fun project in its own way. Um, I, it was kind of an exercise in getting out of my comfort zone, doing something different, like forcing myself not to do all of the weathering things that I usually love to do, and kind of just, you know, sticking to a purpose that was sort of outside of the actual model itself. And, you know, I didn't, like, I got no love for this little Polish airplane. I, it's, it's neat. It's kind of pretty. Uh, but it's not, like, one of my favorites. Um, I didn't know anything about it, really, when I went into the project. I really still don't. I very purposefully chose not to spend much, if any, time looking at references, collecting photos, none of the stuff that I normally do, because that wasn't the point of the project. I was building to a very specific purpose, a very specific look, and that's all that I really cared about with this, and I guess I kind of pulled that off. I don't know. Anyway, it's done, and time off, time to uh, move off and do something more fun, like finish that little Sherman that I showed you a couple of times. So, anyway, as always, I hope you enjoyed this. I hope it was informative. I can confidently say that uh, if you are into Polish aircraft of World War II, that this is a kit you should definitely consider getting. Um, I, you know, I went through the whole thing, and uh, I would absolutely recommend it. I'm not going to get it a ten, give it a 10 out of 10, but hey, uh, you know, what kit ever does get a 10 out of 10, especially for me? Um, it's definitely one that I think uh, is worth buying. So. With that, as always, I appreciate you guys watching, and much love.